Good morning and welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I am glad that you are joining us today uh, with this virtual worship service, uh, and I pray and trust that wherever you are, um, that our hearts and our spirits are together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so uh, let us worship together. Uh, and today we will be hearing a story from the Gospel of Matthew as we've been continuing with these uh, stories from the latter part of Matthew's Gospel. And in the one today, Jesus is confronted and challenged um, by a mixed group of Pharisees and Herodians uh, who were very different from each other, had very different outlooks on faith, uh, and yet they were unified in one thing, which was their equal dislike for Jesus. Um, but that also reminds me, it's not supposed to be um, our equal dislike for Jesus or that we are all challenged by uh, Jesus, who, who kind of confronts us with all of the errors of our ways. Um, while in a way that's a unifying factor, it's not supposed to be the unifying factor. Um, and so it reminds me of another story in the Gospel of John. Um, when Jesus met the woman by the well, uh, and they were talking about the differences between the Samaritans and the Jews and how they didn't like each other very much. Um, but he reminded them that the day would come when people would worship not on the holy mountain of Samaria or not at the temple in Jerusalem, but they would worship together in spirit and in truth. Uh, and we may interpret into that a bit that uh, when we worship together and in spirit and in truth, it is in the spirit of Christ. It is in the way of Christ that we all seek to follow together. It is only in Christ um, that we are all one. Uh, we are no longer men and women, slaves and free, Greek and Gentile. All of the things that divide us in the world are irrelevant as we are one in Christ. And so that is a good reminder of what it is that's supposed to unify us in Christ uh, in a good way, um, not in the way of the Pharisees and the Herodians who were unified in Christ, but it was in their dislike of Christ uh, in which they were unified. Um, today, as we worship together, let us be open to the voice of Christ, a voice that is challenging um, to all of us, to the things that we believe, to the even the, the politics that we'll talk about, the politics that we all hold near and dear, those views about things, the people we like to vote for, Jesus is a challenge to all of those things um, and a lot of our ways, even when we think um, they were in Christian terms. Um, so let us hear the word of Christ to us this day. And as we begin our worship together, I will read to you uh, from Psalm 99. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great name and awesome name. Holy is he, mighty king, lover of justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statutes that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. As we gather to worship this day, let us remember that the Lord our God is holy. That God's ways are not our ways. And our ways are not God's ways. And yet it is Christ who brings us together and brings us into the kingdom of God and teaches us the ways of God in the world. So let us be open to Christ's voice to us this day, and let us worship together. Amen.
Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O tell of his might, O sing of his grace, whose robe is the light and canopy space, his chariots of wrath beneath thunder clouds form. Dark is his path on the wings of the storm. You alone are the matchless king. To you alone be all majesty. Your glories and wonders what tongue can recite. You breathe in the air. You shine in As we approach our scripture reading this day, let us pray together for the Spirit's guidance. Let us pray. O Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we hear this reading today from the Gospel of Matthew, may your Spirit open us to the way of Jesus, to the story about his life and his teaching and to what that means for our lives today as we seek to follow him. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter, beginning with verse 15. Hear the word of the Lord. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or is it not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Did you guess that tune? That's right. It's Take Me Out to the Ball Game. And you may have guessed it, but Miss Karen is having a great week because I am an Atlanta Braves fan. Yeah, and right now when I'm recording this message, the Braves are only two games away from making it to the World Series for the first time in many, many, many years. And I am so excited about that. But you know what? Even if I hadn't told you that I am a Braves fan, you might have guessed it if you had seen me walking around with my little hat on or my tomahawk or even my Braves t-shirt, my lucky t-shirt that's in the wash because I wore it yesterday. You would have known which team I'm on, which team I'm rooting for. And we all have our favorite teams in baseball or football or whatever sport you like to follow. And we have a sign of pride when we wear those jerseys or those t-shirts or put those signs on our cars or our golf carts and let everybody know whose team we're on. Well, in our scripture reading today, those tricky Pharisees, they are trying once again to get Jesus in trouble because they're asking him, should we pay taxes to Caesar? In other words, Whose team are you on, Jesus? And Jesus very wisely answers, you should give Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but you should give God what belongs to God. And what Jesus was telling the Pharisees is that above all else, no matter what team we might think we're on here on earth, we are all on God's team. We are on his team. We're in his kingdom and we're his people. And that's the very best team that we can be on. Now, Jesus was also asking us to think about if we're really on God's team and we're children of God, how should we be acting? What kinds of words should be coming out of our mouths? What kind of actions should we see in our community with our neighbors, our friends, the people we go to school with? the people we really like, and the people who aren't so much our cup of tea. And what he was encouraging us is that we always let through our actions and our words, the fact that we are on God's team show through. Because when we are filled with the light of love and the Holy Spirit, there's no denying what team we're on. So let's pray together. Dear God, Thank you for your invitation to be on your team. Help the light and love that you show us be reflected in our lives. Help us to live the life that you want for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Go Braves! Today's reading, Jesus is questioned about paying taxes. <laughs> it seems like uh, an appropriate question for this time of year as we face the election cycle, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about taxes and how much is too much or how much is too little and how different sides approach that. Well, in Jesus's uh, story here, uh, in the story about Jesus uh, being questioned, the issue isn't really about paying taxes. It's that the Pharisees and the Herodians, in this case, were trying to entrap Jesus and get him into trouble, uh, either with the religious folks on one side or with the Roman government on the other side. It was a trick question. Um, that was being posed to Jesus. So the Pharisees and the Herodians here really are an odd couple, actually. Um, the Herodians were a group of Jews who allied themselves with the occupying Roman authorities, hence being associated with the name Herod. Um, we might see them as being religious, um, but also self-serving, uh, willing to sort of blur the lines between 
faith-related motivations and politically motivated motivations. Um, probably the closest modern-day example I can come up with um, would be kind of what we see in conservative evangelicalism today. Uh, being a pastor, I have noticed over the last four years, a lot of articles pointing out this awkward tendency of many evangelicals today um, to have loudly and unrelentingly condemned uh, the philandering of President Clinton, but to quietly overlook the hush payments to adult film stars with whom the current president had relationships. Well, why would that be among um, conservative Christians today? Well, obviously, it's politically expedient um, to have those kinds of different judgments about uh, similar behaviors, but between two different political parties. Um, it seems like it would be a good thing for Christians to be politically aware and involved, but there is this potential um, to have influence over the political environment and the decisions that are being made. That sounds like a good thing, um, but the danger has always been that, at least as often, uh, political platforms have influence over the Christians' views and behaviors. Uh, how often have conservative evangelicals, for example, sort of gotten used and manipulated for political gain? Um, that has been going on. It's not a new thing. It's something that's been going on in Christianity since uh, it became the religion of the empire under the Emperor Constantine. Uh, and obviously, before that, there were others like the Herodians um, who aligned themselves with the politics of their day. And that influence, though, is always a two-way street. Um, you hope it's the Christians who are influencing national policies, but often it is the politics of the political party, the platform of the political party that has just as much influence on the Christians and their beliefs. Uh, another good example is something I remember Jim Wallace saying um, about so-called pro-life activists. Uh, he pointed out, and is it a comedy or a tragedy, um, that on one side of Christian politics, um, you have people who are staunchly opposed to abortion, um, but at the same time quite supportive of the death penalty and open gun sales, for instance. But on the other side, you have Christians holding prayer vigils before executions and decrying lax gun laws after each mass shooting, but show little concern about the practice of abortion. Why the discrepancies? It's clear that our social and political views influence and change our Christian beliefs just as much as our Christian beliefs influence and change the way we see other issues going on in our society. Wallace expresses his respect, actually, for the Catholic Church and some Christians like Mennonites and Quakers who are at least consistently pro-life across the board, whether it be abortion or uh, capital punishment or gun laws, they are consistently pro-life across the board. But for most Christians in our country, we kind of pick and choose what we want to uh, support in the name of our faith. And then back to Jesus' story, because the Pharisees, on the other hand, were known for their passion for the law and uh, the law of Moses. And they believed that following laws such as circumcision and dietary laws and Sabbath observance were what marked the boundary of who were God's people and who were not God's people. Um, they did not have a lot of interest in what was going on at the national temple or in the halls of power. Um, the Pharisees' base was really among the people uh, at the local synagogue, and their focus was really living faithfully in daily life. 
But often the Gospels tell us of Jesus pointing out that their religious focus is off. Their, their legalism, as well as intentioned as it may have been, um, was, that, and they really thought that it was uh, meant to be faithful to God, but it left little room for grace, little room for compassion, little room for love. The message became all about following the laws, not about helping people. It excluded those perceived as outsiders or those thought of as unclean. It was not at all about helping people or healing people, especially on the Sabbath. And yet Jesus did not have kind words for that outlook on what it meant to follow God. It was not about just sticking to the law, but it was about taking care of people in God's love. So it appears that the only unifying thing between these two groups, the Herodians and the Pharisees, was their dislike of Jesus. What he did and taught, what he stood for, and how he challenged their own more limited views of things. Tom Long notes, Jesus responds to their trick with a gambit of his own. When he asks them for the tax coin, they unexpectedly reach into their own purses and withdraw the evidence that exposes them, not him, as deceptive and hypocritical compromisers. They are the ones carrying around Caesar's money, not Jesus. They are the ones who have the emperor's image in their pocketbooks. They are the ones who have already bought into the system. In our world, we hear both Pharisees, or those religious legalists of our day, and the Herodians, the politically motivated folks who just couch their views in religious language. And they all align themselves with particular politics and social views. But let's be careful about that. Because how often do those Herodians and Pharisees of the world end up actually being in conflict with the ways of Jesus? Does what they work for seem to reflect Jesus' own self-understanding of his purpose? When he quoted the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Does what they stand for seem to show Jesus' teaching to his disciples that true greatness actually lies in loving and serving others? And that being part of God's kingdom, as we hear later in Matthew 25, actually involves taking care of the least of these. Does their behavior reflect the fruits of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Do they behave that way? Or do their ways seem to reflect Colossians when it says, As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Ultimately, in today's story from Matthew, what Jesus seems to get at is that the question posed to him isn't really about what belongs to God. The question is really about who belongs to God. And what does Jesus himself teach us about belonging to God and following God's ways? Another episode of Politics from the Backside. Amen. i
As we approach the end of our service together today, let us remember the ways of Christ, not seeking our own political advantage as those uh, in the story did today, the Pharisees and the Herodians, uh, but seeking instead to focus ourselves, as Jesus said, on loving God and on loving our neighbor, on caring for those, the least of these, um, that Jesus said was part and parcel to being part of the kingdom of God. And so being open and aware and compassionate towards those around us and the needs um, which face them, let us come before God in prayer this day. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, open our hearts and our minds and our spirits beyond these uh, divisive things that, that captivate us these days and bring out such, such strong animosity towards each other. Lord, instead, help us to be at peace in you. 
to open ourselves to what your Spirit is leading us to do, to opening our hearts to the people around us who, who need to know your love and your care, perhaps even through us. Oh Lord, we pray for those in our lives this day who are suffering, who are suffering from hunger, who are suffering from isolation during this pandemic, who are suffering from illness or recovery or surgery, who are suffering from grief, who are struggling with fear. Lord, as we think about those people in our lives, help us to know how we might be a sign of your presence, of your love and grace, and of the ways that you care for us in body as well as spirit. Lord, help us to know how we can help, how we can be the body of Christ in the world and in the lives of others. For we pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as you go out uh, this day and this week, uh, may you go out with a big heart, um, with an open spirit, and with your eyes set on the way of Christ before you and the way that the Spirit is leading you. Go in his grace and in his peace this day. Amen.
Here 